Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Johan Freins. I'm the director of BankTrack, and I'd like to welcome you to the webinar about uh, the benchmark, the human rights benchmark that BankTrack uh, published last week uh, during the uh, uh, Human Rights Conference in uh, Geneva. Um, I guess you are all familiar with BankTrack, but uh, for those who are not, BankTrack is a civil society organization focused on advocating. Sorry, I have to let someone in. Is a civil society organization focused on advocating for a commercial banking sector that respects human rights and nature. We were founded in 2003 as a network of organizations 16 years ago, uh, now a standalone organization. Our mission is to stop banks from financing harmful business activities, promote a banking sector that respects human rights and contributes to just societies and a healthy planet, and to support fellow citizen civil society organizations in their engagement with banks. Um, as I said, we uh, launched uh, the Human Rights Benchmark last Tuesday during the UN Forum on Business and Human Rights, and we have the lead author, Ryan Brightwell, at this uh, webinar to present the report, including its methodology and main conclusions. Uh, after I am uh, finished speaking, uh, he will talk for about 20 minutes, um, after which there will be time for questions, uh, and it would work best if you would type your questions in the chat box, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. Um, I'm not sure if you will all see the questions, but uh, I will pick the questions afterwards, and then Ryan will have some time to uh, respond to them. If there are questions on specific uh, uh, scorings of specific banks, they are best covered in a separate conversation uh, with Ryan, uh, and he's happy to uh, talk with you afterwards. We are recording this webinar, so uh, please be aware of that, and we aim to finish by a quarter past 10 uh, our time. So that's in uh, 40 minutes. I think we covered all the practicalities, and I hand over to Ryan now. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction, Johan. I hope everyone can hear me, and uh, you should be able to see uh, the presentation on on your screens uh, now. So hopefully that's working. Let me know if not. Um, but yes, I'll uh, I'll start with the uh, the presentation. So. Firstly, I wanted to give a bit of overview of the context behind the uh, benchmarking report that we recently published in terms of our overall human rights campaign work. So human rights has been uh, a core part of our campaigning since, uh, since BankTrack started in 2003. And since the UN guiding principles were endorsed in 2011, our focus has been on advocating for their full implementation by the banking sector not because we think the guiding principles are perfect, but because they're the best guidance we've got on what is expected from business when it comes to human rights. And we consider full implementation of the principles by the banking sector would lead to better outcomes for rights holders. Benchmarking is uh, a core stream of this work. And uh, our first benchmark, uh, the Banking with Principles report was published in 2014. Out of a conviction that it was it was time for the sector to move beyond discussing what the principles uh, mean for the private sector banks in theory and to, uh, to look at practice, to look at the extent to which banks were getting on at implementing them. Um, but benchmarking is only one uh, aspect of our work on human rights. We also work on what we term dodgy deals uh, within bank track, companies and projects with severe impacts, uh, environmental and social impacts and we've published three human rights impact briefings to date, examining bank finance for specific dodgy deals in practice and calling on banks to outline how their implementation of the guiding principles and their due diligence uh, works in practice. We also engage uh, with banks and also with sector initiatives, including the OECD process on responsible business conduct in the finance sector, for which we're a member of the advisory group, the Equator Principles, the Principles for Responsible Banking, and other relevant initiatives. And recently we've put together a, a series of briefings and reports on specific policy areas of relevance to human rights, uh, including how banks contribute to human rights violations in December 2017, a report uh, with Oxfam Australia from last year, developing effective grievance mechanisms in the banking sector, and our report on client confidentiality and transparency were unable to comment on specific customers, which was published in March. 
this year. And all of these reports can be found on the Human Rights Campaign uh, webpage on our website. And moving on to the topic of today's webinar, the results of, uh, of the 2019 benchmark. This is our third benchmark, following the first in, in 2014 and the second in 2016. I'll talk through the methodology briefly before giving an overview of the results. The benchmark covers uh, 50 large private sector banks, up from 45 uh, last year, or the last iteration in 2016, I should say. We selected uh, the largest banks in the world by assets under management, and we removed those without substantial involvement in commercial banking, and we then made some adjustments for geographic balance. Uh, so we, we only cover uh, the four largest banks in the, in, uh, from China, uh, which creates space to add uh, some other large regional players, for example, in Latin America. And we've added uh, banks, including Standard Bank in South Africa, which we added for the first time this year, and Spurbank in Russia. We also made sure we include the big four or big five banks in countries where our selection would otherwise include only two or three of them, such as Australia and Japan. Uh, and that's, that's led us to our sample or target group of 50 private sector banks. And uh, we've assessed these banks against 14 criteria, which are based closely on the text of the UN guiding principles, wherever they create responsibilities for business. So largely in the second pillar and also in the third pillar of the UN guiding principles. So our aim is to look very simply at what the guiding principles say that businesses should be doing and ask, are banks showing that they're doing this in their published policies and reporting? And we give a score of one, 0.5 or zero against each criteria leading to a score between naught and 14. The criteria look at banks' human rights policies, their processes around human rights due diligence, their reporting on human rights, and their processes for remedying adverse human rights impacts, including through grievance mechanisms. And we began uh, with our 12 criteria from 2016, and we made some small revisions to some of these following a, a small consultation process with some expert groups. We added two new criteria this year, looking at whether banks have a process to consider whether they may have contributed to an adverse human rights impact or are only directly linked to it and whether their human rights reporting includes indicators relating to their main impacts. So the process and timescales for the report, we informed banks in advance of the process in June, following which we scored the banks, making 700 scoring decisions in total, 14 for each of the 50 banks. Um, and credit goes to my colleague Naomi Geelan, who did a lot of the work on the, uh, the initial draft scoring and, and throughout this, uh, this reporting process and is co-author of the report. Uh, and once these draft scoring decisions were made, we sent uh, the draft scores to each of the 50 banks in August this year. We received comments on the draft scores from 29 out of the 50 banks. A further four responded to say that they have and the 17 banks that we didn't hear from at all. So we worked this year also with an independent academic advisory panel for the first time. Uh, we, well, there were four academics who work uh, on the business and human rights agenda who agreed to, to join the panel. And we sent them a set of scoring dilemmas for which the panelists gave input into whether they agreed or disagreed with the draft scores. And we then finalized our scores on the basis of banks' feedback and on the basis of the input from the advisory panel, uh, which was extremely helpful in, in sort of sharpening our thinking and, and providing an external perspective on the draft scores. Um, and the report was, was published uh, last week. So also this year, for the first time, we've uh, published our rationale, not just bank scores in full, but our rationale for each scoring decision together with banks' comments and our responses to those comments on a series of 50 individual web pages, which you'll find linked to in the appendix of the report and also on the summary table that we've published on our website. <clears throat> uh, 
And so here is our summary table of results. Uh, this isn't intended for you to uh, read through all of the results, but to give an overall impression. We've grouped the banks into leaders, front runners, followers, and laggards based on their scores. And 21 banks, the largest group, are laggards, achieving three points or less out of 14. This includes all of the Chinese banks covered, uh, perhaps more surprisingly, all of the Canadian banks. It also includes uh, French banks and US banks uh, and others. And a, a further 19 banks were ranked as followers, uh, reaching between six points and three and a half. We then have nine front runner banks, scoring more than six, but less than nine points and one leader, which is ABN Amaro, scoring just over the bar at uh, nine, nine and a half points out of 14. So just 10 banks out of 50 score more than six points out of 14, uh, including three Dutch, three Australian uh, banks plus BBVA, Barclays, City and Nordair. And while these banks are front runners, all have much further to go. Uh, and do bear in mind that this report only assesses banks own disclosures rather than their, uh, their actual finance for, for problematic projects or companies. Uh, the next slide shows the results by, by region and we can see uh, blue dots for front runners clustering around um, Europe and Australia with Asian and to a lesser extent Brazilian banks performing uh, poorly and the, the five poor performing Canadian banks influencing uh, a lot of red dots in, uh, in North America as well. And moving on to the, uh, the results for each criteria, I want to try with, with most of the remaining time uh, for this presentation to give a quick overview of how the results break down uh, for each criteria. I'm not going to talk about every single criteria out of the 14, but uh, give an overview of the key findings. Starting with our three criteria looking at, at policy. And these look at whether banks have a policy in place, whether it's approved at a high level, and whether it has a broad scope that includes all of the impacts of a bank's finance. Uh, and the colors on the bar charts here, the blue, refer to banks that were given, the number of banks that were given a full score, the orange or yellow uh, to banks that were given a half score, and the red to the number of banks with no score. So we can see under 1.1 that most banks now have a human rights policy that includes uh, a clear, explicit commitment to respect human rights. This is, uh, this is improved over time, and this is the most positive result that we, that we see in the benchmark. The biggest group of banks scores a half point on policy approval, usually as there is no member or there's no board member or board committee tasked with specific governance oversight of human rights, uh, but the policy is, is approved uh, at a high level. We know that board leadership on human rights can be critical in motivating the rest of the business to follow through on this, so this is an area we're keen to see improvement. And the largest group of banks also do include all aspects of finance in their policy, uh, although not a majority. In 17 cases, banks are getting a half score here, for example, if they're not clear about whether their policy extends to asset management as well as lending, or if they are clear that it doesn't extend to asset management as we often found, and 11 banks uh, received zero score for uh, policies which, which typically only apply to, uh, to their internal operations and staff relationships. So moving to due diligence, we've got five criteria on due diligence, and this slide looks at the first three. The largest group of banks scored a half point for our first criteria on human rights due diligence, indicating they have a process in place, but that this is limited in scope or poorly described. 2.2 um, consultation is really the first major gap that we see in, in the benchmark, with uh, no banks uh, satisfactorily meeting the requirement to make sure that their human rights due, due diligence process includes the views of uh, affected people or potentially affected people in some systematic way. The 11 banks that scored a half point here typically detail an approach to due, due diligence that factors in the views of some stakeholders, for example, trade unions and civil society groups, but 
uh, without a systematic process for seeking the views of uh, potentially affected people, not necessarily for, for all transactions, um, but, but for, for example, for highest risk transactions. Looking at the second group of due diligence criteria, we asked for the first time this year whether banks have a process in place for assessing whether they cause or contribute to an adverse human rights impact via their finance. And we found that they do not. Only four banks scored a half point against this criteria for indicating that they assess whether they caused or contributed, but without detailing a process. It has become quite widely recognized and accepted in the last two years in particular that banks can contribute to human rights abuses uh, through their finance as well as being directly linked. Uh, and this implies that banks need to have a process for assessing this if they're to play a role in remedy where appropriate. And additionally, uh, few banks are showing any evidence that they track the effectiveness of their response to specific adverse human rights impacts. Our criteria on reporting also show some large gaps for the majority of banks. Uh, most banks' human rights reporting is, is critically underdeveloped uh, and it's usually limited to reporting on developments like policy revisions and internal training. 32 banks scored half points for uh, this level of human rights reporting uh, and only six banks met the, the criteria for a full score for, for formally setting out how they uh, what they see is their main human rights impacts and how they're being addressed. These tend to be the banks that are using the UN Guiding Principles Reporting Framework uh, as, uh, as a reference point for their reporting, which, which is an encouraging, an encouraging development and we're starting to see reports come through um, with this benchmark uh, that follow the UN Guiding Principles Reporting Framework. That, uh, that was not so much in evidence in previous years, but it's uh, still clearly early stages. Banks are particularly poor, we found, at reporting on specific impacts, whether they've identified them or whether they've been brought to their attention. Most banks did not mention any specific adverse human rights impacts in their reporting at all, and only two met the criteria for providing information uh, that's specific to evaluate the adequacy of the bank's response to a particular human rights impact, as the guiding principles uh, require. We, uh, we didn't look for banks to name specific customers in our scoring, but uh, we're interested in the extent to which banks do this. And so we reviewed as part of the process, the human rights reporting of all 50 banks where it existed. And we found that only four banks mentioned a specific project or company that they financed in connection with an adverse human rights impact. And in three cases, this was the same project, the Dakota Access Pipeline, which finance for which goes back to 2016. So that's not many projects. And we need banks to be working with their clients to make sure adverse impacts are addressed and talking about how they've done this. This is a core part of the UN Guiding Principles approach. And if banks get it right, they, they should have a positive story to tell together with their customers. Looking at uh, the last group of criteria on access to remedy, uh, these criteria look at remediation processes and the related question of the presence or absence of grievance mechanisms. And this is the lowest scoring area of the benchmark. Our first criteria here looks at whether banks have a commitment and a process for remediating adverse human rights impacts. We found 11 banks had a commitment, but none had a process. The second criteria on this slide looks at whether banks are meeting the responsibility to establish or participate in an operational level grievance mechanism for those who may be adversely impacted by their operations. We identified one bank, uh, National Australia Bank, which has a grievance mechanism that's open to complaints from affected communities and is supported by a process which is elaborated to some extent uh, in the bank's documentation. A further 10 had complaints channels such as an email address or a web page uh, with a form which were explicitly open to human rights campaigns, but uh, which weren't backed by a process and can't be termed uh, fully a grievance mechanism. But none of the banks showed that their grievance mechanism met effectiveness criteria. So this slide shows uh, all of those 14 indicators 
in terms of the average score achieved for each one on a scale of 0 to 1. And we can see here uh, low average scores overall, uh, but higher scores when it comes to policy, uh, getting progressively lower as we look at due diligence reporting uh, and very, very low scores on grievance mechanisms and remediation. <clears throat> Excuse me. This chart looks at how the picture has changed since our last report in 2016. The average score has hardly changed at all, uh, with an average score in 2019 of 28.5% and an average score in 2016 of 28.3%. Now, that's to a large extent to do with the addition of two new criteria on which banks did badly. And if we set these aside, we see the average score improving from 3.4 out of 12 in 2016 to 3.7 out of 12 in 2019, setting aside those two new criteria. However, this is hard to characterize as anything other than slow progress. The World Banks had improved their scores by more than three points, showing that significant improvements are possible with concerted effort. These included BBVA in Spain, which improved its score by four points to become a front runner. Uh, National Australia Bank, which also moved from uh, moved to be a front runner from being a laggard previously, and Morgan Stanley and Standard Chartered, which also improved by three and a half points to become followers from being laggards previously. We do want to emphasize the, that there are limitations of this report. Uh, it does assess what banks say they do in their own policies and practice and, and reporting. It doesn't consider banks finance for actual adverse human rights impacts and their reactions to them. And our advice to uh, anyone uh, using and reviewing these uh, the bank scores is to look at the bank's results together with uh, the profiles that we have of each bank covered in this report on the bank track website, and particularly their record of financing uh, particular dodgy deals. So to finish with our, our call to action for banks are the four key demands that we've identified as a priority for banks to, to work on at this point. And we see an urgent need for banks to, to focus on remediation of the most severe impacts. We're not seeing evidence in, in any bank's uh, human rights reporting of uh, how they have identified an adverse human rights impact and worked with their clients, for example, to, to remediate that impact. And that needs to happen to, to show that banks' human rights policies are really having an impact on the ground. So banks need to prioritize the most severe adverse human rights impacts and actively seek to ensure that they're remedied, focusing on the needs and interests of rights holders in each situation. Reporting needs to improve, including using indicators to show how uh, specific, well, to show the number and type of adverse impacts that have been identified by the bank or uh, impacts that have been raised by stakeholders and showing how these are prioritized by severity, and detailing the steps taken uh, to resolve the impact for all of the most severe impacts rather than just a selection of case studies. Thirdly, uh, develop effective grievance mechanisms. Operational level grievance mechanisms are one of the most systematic ways that businesses can ensure that uh, adverse human rights impacts are remediated and it's time for banks to show how they're meeting their responsibilities under the guiding principles here. And lastly, overcome client confidentiality concerns and move towards open books. Uh, the right to disclose client relationships can be uh, written into lending agreements. And, uh, and this needs to start to happen. Uh, it, it has started to happen in some circumstances, but it's very limited at the moment. Doing so can enhance trust. It can lead to improved reporting as banks are able to disclose more about their efforts to remedy specific impacts. And it can uh, help with ensuring grievance mechanisms are effective by enabling affected communities to see who's financing the projects that impact them. Uh, eight years on, from the introduction of the UN Guiding Principles, the, the really slow pro progress that we've seen means we need to look beyond voluntary action from banks and we do need to encourage regulators uh, to play a more active role, to take steps to address the uh, critical gaps that, uh, that this report has identified, including the lack of transparency around bank finance 
and the actual rights impact associated with it and ensuring that proper channels for remedy are available to victims. So that brings the presentation to an end. Um, and I'd like to just finish by saying we welcome any questions or, or comments on the benchmarkers. Uh, we're going to have a discussion after, after this presentation, but also if you have specific questions or comments on individual scores, we're happy to discuss those further uh, with individual banks. We're also interested in your feedback on the methodology uh, and the results. And I want to emphasize that uh, there's much more richness of detail in the report itself, uh, including uh, pages looking at specific, uh, specific aspects that haven't been looked at here, such as the Modern Slavery um, Act in the UK and free prior and informed consent. So do have a look at the full report if you haven't yet. And, uh, and my contact details are there on the screen as well. So thanks very much and, uh, and it's time to uh, move on to uh, questions. Thank you very much, uh, Ryan. Um, that was exactly on time, almost 10 o'clock here.